Chapter 10, Dashi. Hello, friends. Gather round as we dive back into the twisting, turning vortex of the three-body problem. It's a wild ride today, so let's jump right in. Enter Dashi, our favorite rough-around-the-edges yet good-hearted cop. He's been following Wang, and what's his remedy for Wang's cosmic-induced panic? Good all liquid courage. That's right, he takes Wang out for drinks, encouraging him to spill the story of his last 24 hours. Despite the staggering revelations, she doesn't seem to be ruffled. Between sips, he's more focused on his own daily grind. His advice to Wang, drink, sleep, and stay grounded in the here, and now instead of fretting over the universe. But wait, it's not all pub chatter and life advice. She shares a series of odd happenings that have been troubling him. Crimes against academic institutions, a surge in audacious environmental activism, rustic movie themes taking center stage, and well-funded cults gaining momentum. Whoa, sounds like the world's got some pretty eccentric stuff brewing. She puts his detective hat on, suggesting someone's trying to torpedo scientific research, an inkling shared by General Chang. Wang, intrigued, asks about the war Chang alluded to. Unfortunately, our lovable cop she is in the dark about that, only knowing about China's partnership with NATO and a sudden wave of fear among the normally fearless. She's parting wisdom for Wang. Get back to work and keep playing the three-body game during his downtime. Guess everyone needs a hobby, huh? With a wink and a nod, she speeds off before Wang can even say thanks. What a guy. And that's it for this chapter, folks. It seems we're entering a world where the ordinary and the extraordinary collide, making for an unforgettable journey. Remember, in the words of Shi, sometimes you've got to focus on the drink in front of you, and let the universe do its thing. Chapter 11, Three Body, Mosey, and Fiery Flames. Host his drinking session with the friendly cop, Dash. Our hero Wan purchases a V-suit and promptly dives back into the virtual reality game Three Body. Time and reality warp again in the game as eons seem to have passed. And the palace of King Zhu morphs from Egyptian to Aztec. Wang's curiosity is piqued by a peculiar machine that's powered by enslaved individuals manipulating a copper sphere in seemingly random ways. Wang's exploration is interrupted by the arrival of a man introducing himself as Mosey. This tall figure acquaints Wang with the unfortunate fate of previous civilizations. All of them were wiped out by the brutal chaotic eras, with the most advanced, civilization number 139 reaching up to the Steam Age before being destroyed. According to Moses' calculations, a long, stable era is anticipated. As the world starts to rehydrate, Wang uses a shaded telescope to observe the sun, noticing striking differences between the game's sun and the real one. He marvels at the game designer's intricacy, embedding layers of information within seemingly simple images. Intriguingly, Mosey has a theory of his own. He envisions the universe as two nested hollow spheres, floating amidst a sea of fire. The holes in these spheres let in the light of the sun and stars, while their irregular movements are dictated by the fiery sea. But Mosey's model raises more questions than it answers, especially when it comes to those mysterious flying stars. As time zooms ahead in the game, Mosey's prediction of a long, stable era seems to come true. Wang examines the game's sun and finds its structure intriguingly different from Earth's sun. The game designers, he realizes, have layered in vast amounts of hidden data within seemingly simple imagery. Wang's observations continue until one day, the sun doesn't rise. Although the impending collapse of civilization seems imminent, Mosey, full of conviction in his calculations, insists that the sun is just skipping a few days and will rise soon enough. And indeed it does, but with a devastating speed that sets the world on fire, consuming Mosey and Wang in its fiery onslaught. Wang wakes from the game, shaken and introspective. The boundaries between the game's reality 
and the real world blur, creating an unsettling feeling. He seeks solace in work, but can't keep his escalating sense of dread at bay for long. Opting for a change of scenery, he pays a visit to Yi Wenji, who dismisses his queries about her past during the Cultural Revolution, preferring instead to discuss her experiences at the Red Coast base. Stay tuned, fellow voyagers, as we delve deeper into Yi Wenji's story and the mysteries of the three-body game in our next chapter. Chapter 12, Red Coast 2 Let's dive into the mysteriously shrouded walls of Red Coast Base with Yi Wenji as our eyes and ears. Like a rookie in the big leagues, Yi starts off with seemingly menial tasks, her unique civilian attire setting her apart in this military stronghold. You can feel the tedium eating into her, the monotony of the same old, day in, day out. But you see, Yi's a trooper. As the days turn into weeks, and weeks into months, her colleagues begin to crumble under the crushing monotony, seeking transfers from the base. In the meantime, our heroine, with steely resilience, grows in stature within the base, slowly shedding the shackles of her superior's suspicions. Commissar Lei, an imposing figure, starts showing some warmth towards Yi. He pulls back the curtain a bit, revealing that they're not just fixing broken bolts here. Nope, they are, in fact, orchestrating disruption of enemy satellites using an unbelievably large-scale microwave antenna. Whoa, talk about raising the stakes. Next, he is transferred to the cutting-edge monitoring department, where sophisticated tech hums around her. Here, she's confronted by a massive radio receiver designed to eavesdrop on the faintest whispers from the deep abyss of space. Despite grappling with her new role, the ever-inquisitive Yi, like a detective piecing together a cryptic puzzle, starts noticing odd discrepancies in the base's operations. Something's fishy, folks. The climax of the chapter hits us like a freight train. Yi is summoned to the base's nerve center, the main office. There, surrounded by the grim faces of the officers, she is offered a mind-blowing revelation. He is given a chance to reject this explosive knowledge. But guess what? He, ever the truth seeker, chooses to know. She wants the truth. And that, my friends, is where we leave you hanging until the next chapter. What a roller coaster of a ride this one was. Stay tuned for more, and remember, in the world of the three-body problem, nothing is ever as it seems. Chapter 13, Red Coast 3. So, picture this, a top-secret report from the 1960s, aged and yellowed, a secret waiting to be unfurled. It talks about scientific philosophy, the gradualistic versus saltatory modes of science. It's like the classic tortoise, and hair race, where gradualistic science is slow and steady, applying theories bit by bit. Saltatory science, however, jumps headfirst into practical applications like a sprinting hare, often leading to a technology leap. Now, picture a global race, with NATO and the Soviet Union trying to leapfrog each other to achieve these rapid technological advancements. China, the report suggests, should be gutting for these saltatory leaps, these daring vaults into the cutting-edge spheres of physics, biology, computer science, and wait for it. SETI. That's right, folks, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Imagine a quest not just to look beyond our skies, but to venture into the deep cosmic abyss, seeking the unknown, the alien. Our little red coast base isn't just about satellites anymore. It's a player in the grand cosmic opera, competing with international efforts like the United States Project Ozma and the Soviet Union's sprawling radio telescope system. The report hints at potential risks if extraterrestrials hear only their voices, urging China to speak up to ensure a balanced cosmic dialogue. The report then unveils Red Coast's grand purpose, the search for alien life, and the potential to make contact. They've developed a complex code based on the universal language of mathematics. Imagine a space-age Rosetta Stone designed to commune with cosmic civilizations. Now, what to say to our interstellar neighbors? That's the question. Initial drafts 
are too earthly, too critical of superpowers like the U.S. and USSR. But the final message, oh, it's a beaut. It speaks of human civilizations, triumphs. It struggles against inequality and a burning desire to create an ideal civilization in harmony with extraterrestrial life. The report concludes with a resonating affirmation of the long-term importance of this endeavor. Aliens, as neutral observers, could provide a unique perspective on the saga of humanity. Well, folks, this chapter truly takes the story to a whole new level, making us consider not just the story unfolding on our little blue planet, but the possibilities of the grand cosmos. What's in store for ye? and the rest of the gang at the Red Coast base. Stick around to find out. If you've traveled with me this far into the video, I'd be thrilled if you'd consider giving me a pat on the back with the like button. But if this journey didn't quite do it for you, don't fret, maybe our next adventure will. Subscribing is your passport to join me as we explore more exciting chapters in the vast landscape of books. Help shape the future, by leaving a comment with book recommendations for chapter summaries or feedback to enhance the channel.